Well, welcome to Peak Youth. Welcome to Peak Youth. A uh, question. Does anybody else feel like their family is like really, really crazy? Anybody feel like they have a crazy, crazy family? Yeah. Would anybody like to share why you think that your family is like crazy? Yeah? One right here. Okay. Why, why is your family cray cray? Is, is it muted? Okay. Hello? There it is. So, I have uh, two dogs, two cats, uh, two other brothers, and one sister living, currently living in our house. Um, every every day, somebody has, we're all getting in, sh- trying to rush into a shower, and um, usually our newer dog poops on the floor. Yikes! <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. We have, a, we have an eccentric one over here. Why is your, that, that, that has got to be a crazy family. What, this one here? Yeah, blue shirt. So, you're taking my Okay. So this one right next to me. Okay. She's the crazy one. Oh, okay. All and right. my dog. All right, Kelly. I would say she's the mother of the family. The mother she, of the family? Okay. She mothers my brother and my <laughs> sister most of the time, and it gets annoying. And she mothers yeah. the whole seventh grade girls. That's okay. Good. Uh-huh. All right. All right, just one one big crazy seventh grade family. Okay, <laughs> okay. Hey, all right, I one more maybe. Get back here because yeah, yeah. um, I think this one's going to actually really play into our story here. Adam. All right, all right. Why is your family right. so crazy? Okay, so um, we're going to start off with the fact that I have twelve humans in my family. Man, oh man! Like in all my right. house, and we have a four bedroom, three bathroom house. Whoa! I have three dogs, four cats. Whoa! Um, <laughs> and the oldest kid, there's 10 kids, including myself. The oldest kid is 16. There's two 16-year-olds. And then the youngest one is seven months old, I think. Oh, my goodness. And then I have another brother who lives away who's turning 20 in February. Okay. And then I have another brother in Pennsylvania and a stepsister who lives in Texas. Man, all right. That, that's, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. All right, maybe, maybe one more, one more. Okay. Maybe one more. All right. Let's see, crazy family, crazy, I mean, like, the craziest family. Oh, oh, okay. All right, Justin. <laughs> um, I have Amanda and Jimbo. Oh, man, yikes. <laughs> the craziest. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he, he has Amanda and Jimbo. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> all right. Um, Amanda Humph- the Humphreys, they're, they're, uh, Amanda's our youth pastor. All right. Uh, so, as I mentioned last fall, as I mentioned last, or excuse me, as I mentioned last week, my bad, uh, we're going to be talking about the story of Joseph all fall. And we're going to learn how Joseph was a man of integrity and someone that we can really strive to be like in our everyday life. But I'm going to tell you, man, his childhood and his early adulthood were a complete mess. And the root cause of all of his strife can be attributed straight to his crazy family. And I can totally relate. I mean, before I got married, I had like the beautiful, you know, just golden blonde, golden brown hair. It was just flowing. It was fantastic. And now after I had kids, I mean, look at this. It's ridiculous, right? It's irritating that that's what happened for my crazy family, all right? Now, whether, <laughs> whether we like to admit it or not, our families, they have a huge impact on us, right? Whether good or bad. And so today, we're going to take a look at Joseph's parents. So his father, let's just dive right in. His father, Jacob, he was the second born of twin brothers. And that's important. That's a key detail. Because back in ancient times, if you weren't the first born male, you didn't really matter. And I, can underst- and I understand this is completely different from our modern society. But to truly understand their family's story, we first have to understand the culture of their time. And in the ancient world, just like in some parts of the world today, still today, the firstborn male would receive a double portion of the family's inheritance and would assume the role of head of household once the father either passed away or just wasn't able to fill the role. See, the firstborn was considered sacred to God because he represented the prime of human strength and vitality as the very first offspring of his father. And so the position was highly regarded in Jewish culture. 
And this is a key thing to remember as we go through Joseph's story, where it's going to come up several times. For now, let's get back to Jacob. As I mentioned, he was a twin, but was born after his brother Esau. So naturally, Esau would have received everything as firstborn son. But Jacob, he ends up tricking his brother Esau into giving him that firstborn designation and everything that came along with it, all because Esau came home hangry one day. And I get it, I get hangry sometimes, but I don't think I'd ever do something that boneheaded. And I I hope that was like the best meal that Esau ever had because he gave up a lot. Anyways, If that wasn't bad enough for poor Esau, Jacob ends up tricking his old and blind father, Isaac, into giving him the family blessing as well, which would have gone to Esau. Needless to say, Esau, he gets a little irritated by that. And so he actually vows to kill his brother Jacob once Isaac passes away. Emotional damage! Yeah. You see, but then Jacob finds out. Jacob finds out, and he decides to move away, which was probably a good idea, right? Just, you know, kind of avoid the whole conflict with Esau. And he decides to go live with his his uncle uh, Laban far away. While he's there, Jacob falls in love with a girl named Rachel, and he works out a deal with with Laban to marry her. However, on their wedding day, Laban, Laban gives Jacob Rachel's older sister, Leah, to marry instead, which obviously infuriates Jacob. I mean, it was a total bait and switch. They had a deal, and at the last minute, Laban changed the terms of the deal. Emotional damage! But then, Jacob works out a new deal with Laban to marry Rachel also. Side note, even though God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman, people have never really stuck with God's design, unfortunately, have they? Anyways, we all know what happens next. Right? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a little Jewish kid in the baby carriage, right? And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Thirteen little Jewish kids, to be exact. Thirteen. Yeah. But they all weren't exactly legitimate. See, Rachel, the woman that Jacob first fell in love with, she wasn't able to conceive. But Leah was. So out of jealousy, Rachel offers her servant Jacob instead or excuse me, her offers her servant to Jacob instead. And rather than taking the high road and consoling his discouraged, depressed wife, he goes along with it, which of course only makes matters worse. Then Leah, she ends up doing the same thing. She offers her servant to Jacob and he goes along with it again. So eventually there, he has 11 children from three different women. Then finally, finally, Rachel's able to conceive and that's when Joseph comes into the picture. Number 12 out of 13 from yet another woman. Emotional damage! (laughs) I can't even imagine all of the drama that had to have happened in that house on a daily basis. But then again, that's what happens when we ignore God's design, right? I mean, to say Joseph was a product of a blended family would have been quite the understatement. And his father, I mean, this guy was far from a model dad. You see, Jacob was a liar, He was a cheater, and he was basically a womanizer pretty much his entire life. I mean, this guy was basically a dirtbag, even though he had moments when he actually did the right thing, every once in a while. Also, the Bible doesn't give exact ages for when each kid was born, but from what I found, Jacob was somewhere in his 90s when Joseph was born. 90 years old. Yeah, crazy, right? All right, so we talked about Jacob for a little bit. Or we talked about Jacob, Joseph's dad, a little bit. Let's switch to his mom, Rachel. Remember, she was his dad's favorite wife, which is still crazy to even say. Uh, he did have four, though. Uh, also, remember that she wasn't able to conceive right away. She wasn't able, able to have kids until much later in life. And unfortunately, as you get older, getting pregnant comes with a higher chance of birth defects and delivery issues which is exactly what happens with Joseph's baby brother, Benjamin. Rachel ends up dying uh, while giving birth to Benjamin when Joseph was only eight years old. So, imagine that you're eight years old. You lose your mom. Your dad is like around 100 years old now. Clearly, he's not going to be, you know, tossing the football out in the yard or, you know, shooting some basketball with you at 100, right? 
So you're probably going to be relying on your older siblings to take care of you. And we're going to take a look at them in a couple weeks. Emotional damage! Yeah. <laughs> for now, for now, I just want to point out the fact that we don't get to pick our parents or our circumstances that we have to endure. I mean, I've been so blessed to have one set of parents and that just a few weeks, a few days ago, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, happy anniversary, mom and dad. Love you. But I know some of you haven't had the same experience. I mean, some of you had to deal with all the pain that comes from your parents splitting up. Or maybe you've had to bury a mom or a dad. And I can't imagine how difficult that must be. But if I can give any consolation, any consolation at all, it's that our Heavenly Father not only sees you, but he loves you 100% without condition. And if you will let him, he can still give you exactly what every person on the face of this earth most desires, meaning and purpose. Meaning and purpose to experience life to the fullest, which is exactly what God does with Joseph. I mean, Joseph was the 11th born son of Jacob in a culture that really only values the first one. I mean, in their culture, Jacob, Joseph would have been a complete nobody. But when he's about the same age as you all, maybe a little, maybe a little older, he was 17, God gives him a dream, and he goes to tell his brothers about it. He says this. He says, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. So I'm sure you're probably asking yourself, man, what the heck is a sheaf? Well, I'm not a farmer, but apparently wheat, when it's fully grown, and it looks something like this. Right, I'm sure hopefully maybe you guys, maybe down in Mary, St. Mary's, maybe you've seen like, or maybe in Calvary, you've seen some like straw fields, right? So we, we've seen this. All right, so now in 2023, we would use tractors and machinery and we cut it down and bale it up and it's going to look something like this, a straw, like a straw bale, a wheat bale, right? However, back in the day, they didn't have tractors or machines and all this stuff. So they would actually cut wheat by hand and they would bale it with string by hand into what's called a sheaf. It looks something like that. That way they could easily pick them up and, and move them to wherever they needed to go. So in Joseph's dream, he and his brothers, they're out in the field. It's harvest time. They're gathering the wheat crop. And somewhere in that process, Joseph's bailed sheaf just mysteriously stands straight up in the middle of the field. And the sheaves of all of his brothers, the ones that they've bailed, they're just bound together. They're lying on the ground around his sheaf as if they're bowing in reverence to him. A little weird, I know, a little weird. Then a little later on, he has another dream. Joseph has another dream. And for some reason, he, tells the, he has the need to go tell his brothers about it again because I'm sure they loved hearing about it, the first one so much. I mean, imagine if your brother or sister came up, or your, your older brother, or excuse me, your younger brother or sister came up to you and was like, hey, I'm going to be your boss someday. Probably wouldn't like that very much, right? It wouldn't go over very well. But anyway, that's what he does. So he comes up and he says this. He says, listen, I have another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebukes him, and he says, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Like, are you kidding me? I mean, clearly these dreams were not well received with his family, as I'm sure you can guess. And we're going to look into that again in, a couple, in two weeks. For now, I just want to focus on the dreams. So Joseph, 12-year-old kid, has a dream that he's going to be exalted over his entire family at some point. And in spite of everything he's had to endure with his parents, overcoming the loss of a mother, dealing with a less than average dad, and the sibling, sibling, sibling excuse me, rivalry that we're going to talk about next week, uh, in two weeks, he still remains faithful to God. And at some point, God is going to honor his faithfulness to him. So, how can we relate Joseph's story to our own relationship with our parents? Now, maybe your parents are like mine. Maybe you got a great relationship with them, and, and this story really just doesn't resonate very much with you. But I bet you have a friend who is struggling with their parents. Or maybe your parents are split up, and you just feel stuck in the middle of all their emotional baggage and their drama. Or maybe your parents struggle with addiction. And it's just so hard to see your parents that way. 
Maybe your parents are still together, but they just fight all the time, and you're, just, you're, like, you're stuck in the middle, and you just put your headphones on, your earbuds in, and just to drown it all out. Or maybe you lost one of your parents, like Joseph did, and you have no idea how to deal with this deep loss in your life. All of our situations are different. But regardless of our relationship status with our parents, we have the ultimate parent. The parent that created us. The parent that knit us together in our mother's womb. The parent that knows you and loves you and cares for you more deeply than any other parent on earth. And he promises to never leave you and never forsake you. And even though we may have all emotional damage from our parents or families, we can overcome it with God's help. We don't have to be victims of our circumstances. We can choose joy in spite of our circumstances. We may not be happy with our current situation, but there's joy that we receive from above that produces hope within us. And that hope, it just can't be dispelled. So as Paul mentions in Colossians 3, I hope that we can just set our minds on things above and not on earthly things, things that just fade away, but uh, the love that comes from an amazing, incredible father. All right, so I want to invite you guys back next week. Uh, we're going to devote the whole, the whole night just to being with your small group. Uh, it's going to be a blast. If you were here last year, uh, you remember, it was just it was a, so much fun just running around the church looking for different clues and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, so just definitely invite you to come back. Uh, please bring a friend with you. Uh, it, there, it's going to be so much fun. Uh, and actually, uh, one quick note, uh, my bad, Amanda, we're, actually, we're going to meet in here uh, next week. Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll meet in the auditorium. Uh, and then the following week on October 3rd and 4th, uh, we'll look at another critical influence, like I mentioned, in Joseph's life with a message called, Bruh. And if you didn't finish, uh, if you didn't read Genesis 37, 1 through 11 this week, uh, go back and read it, and then also just go ahead and continue, finish reading chapter 37 over the next two weeks, and you'll be, you'll be all caught up and ready for, uh, ready for our message on October 3rd and 4th. Also, uh, before we pray, I just want to mention, um, if today's message just kind of stirred something in your heart, maybe some, some just stirred up something that you, maybe you're, you're dealing with or something like that, and uh, you want to just talk to somebody, uh, please come grab me, come grab Amanda, grab a, one of your small group leaders. We would love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. Um, please don't leave here tonight with at least, at least just setting up a time to talk. Uh, we, would love to, we would love to talk with you and pray with you. Uh, so please take advantage. All right, let me pray for us, and then, uh, then we'll get to small groups. Dear Lord God, I just thank you so much um, that you are an amazing father to us. God, regardless of our relationship with our, with our earthly parents, you are the ultimate parent. You are our heavenly father. You care deeply for us. You knew us before we were even born. You, knew, you know everything on our hearts, everything in our minds. And God, I just pray that, that tonight that these teens would just know that, would know you, would know the, know the God who knows them so deeply and have a desire to grow a relationship with you. God, I pray for our small groups. I pray for our conversations, that you would be in our midst. God, I just, I thank you for these teens. I thank you for these leaders. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.